Welcome to the team preview of the Beijing Bears. Yes, excellent. But before we get into that too, oh, well, well we've got Costa, we've got Avril, we've got Jonathan and myself to, uh, to break down this team and all of the stuff that's going on around it as well. I, I want to I wanna pitch you this one to start off with because the LA Valiant, they're looking a lot better than they did last year. I think that's undeniable. And also, I think they've got a coaching staff that you can believe in. You know, you, you can actually have some faith in this coaching staff that they're going to make the right moves or at least as good moves as they possibly can. But here's the problem. They're competing in a region that seems to me to be outrageous. The APAC region, when I look at it on paper, is absolutely absurd. NYXL is not going to be there. The, uh, the website still hasn't been updated 10 years later. The fucking the speed that the Overwatch League moves at. But these teams are pretty stacked. When I... The more I start thinking and the more we do these team previews, the more I think APAC is going to be simply hands down better than North America this year. I, I, I suspect that Avril will be on board with that take because he's the perennial <laughs> APAC lover. But I want to I hear from Scott, from Jonathan. What do you think about that? Because it, it, it's been either very debatable before or North America has looked a bit better in some of the years. So what do you think? Uh, I completely agree with the take. I think that almost all seven of these uh, APAC teams will be at least middle of the pack in North America. I think there is probably like five teams in NA that I would put below almost every APAC team. Uh, I think Los Angeles Valiant, for me, is probably the bottom of this APAC region. So then it becomes, who would you put below the Los Angeles Valiant? And I think after we talk about the team, it'll make more sense. But, Scott, you know, I can't every, see... Scott, every single one of the Valiant fans, and I use the word one because it's Taze on day. <laughs> Am I they've one of them? I... <laughs> they've, tuned, they've tuned out. As soon as you said that the worst team in APAC, they all, every, every one of them just left. We've just dropped Taze on day as a fan, and that's it. There's no one watching the video anymore. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just, I, I it, it's true, I, it, which is sad because the NA region has actually been getting better. I don't think there is any like, you know, bottom feeder team in the North American region, but I still don't believe that they're better than these APAC teams. I think you guys are off the goop a little bit. Oh, really? Okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. I do actually. Okay. Well, I haven't even said okay. anything yet. So, so <laughs> if you look at if you look at the top teams, then yeah, sure. You know, Shanghai Dragons, best team in the league. You know, Chengdu Hunter is going to be amazing. Hangzhou Spark, a bit of contender. Seoul Dynasty got Fizz and Profit. But when you say that like APAC will be good, I think you mostly what you what you're trying to say is that it will be a very competitive region. You know, you have a lot of teams that are battling for like the third to fourth spot, like Philadelphia, Seoul will be battling with Hangzhou, um, Guangzhou and Valiant have like an outside chance. But overall, like it's a good competitive region with a lot of teams that can beat each other. But if you compare them, like the top teams, like side by side, I don't think there's a huge discrepancy. If you look at the North American region and you say, well, okay, how does um, Atlanta Rain, Dallas Fuel, Los Angeles Gladiators, New York Excelsior, San Francisco Shock, Washington Justice, those teams are all like comparable to the APAC teams. So I don't think that one region is necessarily like a lot better than the other ones. Like Dallas Fuel, they've made some good additions themselves. They're even better than they were last season, arguably, picking up a new main support whoa, and new hit scan to run We haven't team. got into Dallas yet. San don't Francisco give people Shock. the spoilers. I'm just saying, like, if you compare them <laughs> side by side, the top seven teams in NA. Like even even Washington Justice with like a new support line where you have Vigilante, for example, and you have Decay Happy, like it's a great team. Houston Outlaws, and Dante and Pelican, like side by side, I think the best seven teams in NA are very comparable, if not better, to the seven teams in APAC. Oh, okay. you can't compare the best seven teams versus the only seven teams in APAC though, because you have to count for the distribution, the overall distribution, right? You have to, for me, I'd have to compare the worst team in NA versus the worst team in APAC, the best team in NA versus the best team in APAC, and then whatever the middle team in both the regions are it's as well. It's not North kind of... America's fault that they just have a sh clump of shit at the bottom with like Vancouver, <laughs> London, and Paris. Like, that's not their fault, you know? Well, that is okay, but... quickly. <laughs> it's not, they just, they have these teams, they can't be held accountable for that. So you got to compare the top teams. You can't just blame, you can't just say like Dallas Fuel, you're in a region with Vancouver Titans. Like that's your problem. That's your fault. So we're just not going to ignore Vancouver. We're just going to not talk about them when we're talking about regions. Like we're talking about like how top heavy they are, no? Like I was talking about the bottom half. 
Well, I also, wasn't talking about the top half. Here's how I think about it. Four out of seven, which is over 50% of the APAC teams, look really good. And I can't say the same for North America. That's how I think about things, the, a, a large amount of these teams. And so if, if I try and drag this back to being about the Beijing Bears again, this team is going to find it very difficult because the only team I think that they can realistically compete with is the Guangzhou Charge. That's the only team that's kind of... Or maybe if the Hangzhou Spark shit the bed as well, but they don't hey, have... Hey, hey! They, they don't have those Calm teams, down though. with the Hangzhou Spark slander. <laughs> they, okay, sorry, Jonathan. They don't have those teams, though, that are at the bottom for them to pick a fight with. It's going to be a really difficult season. So what do you think are reasonable... Before we even dive into the roster, what do you think are the expectations? Like... What do you think would even be a good season for the Valiant? Just simply winning more maps than they did last year? Yeah. <laughs> not, What's not, the benchmark? Not zero 24. Something higher than 0 24 is already a great start. <laughs> yeah. And then beyond that, um, look, if they can if they can get one up, oh, it'll be a sad day. If, oh, I hate to be that guy. I hate to be a sad day if they were sixth place and some other team had to be like, oh man, we're worse than the Valiant. That would be heartbreaking for the Guangzhou Charger, whoever it, it might end up doing that. But <laughs> it could be I, anyone, I, mainly the Charge, but it could be anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it could be, yeah, yeah. The other, any of the other six teams not called Shanghai could be anyone. But um, I Valiant probably are still seventh. Like, realistically, I still have them seventh. Not because they just still suck, but they leveled up. But unfortunately, every other team did as well. If you put this LA Valiant team and just shove them into last year in APAC, I think they'd do well. They probably wouldn't be last place. They'd probably be, be better than Spark, be better than Guangzhou, considering those two teams shot the bed. Um, you know, maybe even NYXL. It's why well, actually NYXL started to get quite good towards the end of the year. But my point is Valiant would be pretty good if they entered last year with this roster. But they've entered this year against every other team that has massively improved. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think seventh. I Here's the thing that you should be optimistic for. The, the missing Valiant fans that left the stream already. I think they're going to be last. <laughs> but they're going to be competing for matches more consistently compared to competing for just to right. capture a point at some point in a match. Like they yeah. actually have a good roster and let's be realistic. You know, Johnny, you're going to hate this. The spot could easily shit the bed. They've done it so many times <laughs> over the last few seasons. They could absolutely drop the spaghetti again. And like Guangzhou, they could easily do the same thing. Both of them have shown failures in management and coaching. If that happens again, I could easily see the Valiant just stepping over those dead mm. teams and, yeah. you know, getting fifth, uh, fifth well, or sixth. Well, before we continue to dig into the roster, a word from our partners. Are you Tay Zonde? Do you support the Beijing Bears and you 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 but you actually live in LA and you wish that you lived somewhere else? Well, you can use NordVPN to disguise where you live by by clicking it, the button. I've got it on my uh, I've got it on my phone. They even have a, a phone app which I actually use a lot. Uh, and I'm not just using it in Europe. Very useful. It's incredibly useful. It's a very, it's a very user-friendly VPN. If you've never tried any different VPN before and you're interested, or you, you know, you're wondering, oh, is it going to be difficult to set up? It's a single click of a button. Now, it it also doesn't have a Chinese VPN, like a VPN to make you look like you're from China. So it doesn't quite fit with this Beijing Bears analogy. <laughs> but also, but also, <laughs> but also. Why would you want to? It, it does have, for example, though, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Do you do you want to VPN into Bosnia and Herzegovina? All do you want time. to look at what's on their Netflix? You can. It just it's just a click of a button. It's it's doable. And if you use uh, nordvpn.com slash platcha or you just find your own way to the URL, you know, you don't have to necessarily use that. Uh, URL, and you use the code PLATCHAT, you know, I, I believe in all of you guys, you can type. If you do that, then you will get a discount on your yearly membership, you'll get a month free, and you'll get a bonus gift. So don't say we've never done anything for you, alright? We're giving you a good product here. We're, we're mm -hmm. selling a good product. And also, we're giving you a great discount. So don't ever come at me and say PLATCHAT's done nothing for me, because we're giving, we're yeah. giving you a good deal here. Alright, let's get into this roster. Are you if you still are, uh, a Los Angeles Valiant fan, and you're worried about your privacy and leaking that, you can use a VPN to hide the fact that you support <laughs> Team Valiant. Yes. You just don't want other people knowing you're a Valiant fan. Yeah, it protects your data. You can't leak it. That's if, you, true. if you're physically in Beijing, I suppose you could use a VPN to, to break the firewall, and then you get to see the whole internet. Ooh, yeah. now that, that's a good idea. 
<laughs> uh, uh, anyway, let's talk about this team, though. Let's talk about the actual roster. Digging into the LA Valiant roster, I want to start with the coaching staff before we even get to the players, because this is one of the things that I think is most exciting this year compared to last year is that they have a competent leadership. They're, they actually have somebody with a vision of what they want to do. Uh, no Hill has done a good job within contenders, has connections to players, has connections apparently to fucking live events or whatever the hell was going on recently in terms of like, he's got the hookup to play in some live event somewhere. Did you guys see that that was going on on Twitter? I can't remember who reported about that. The, no Hill's just got the fucking, just got the fucking deets for some live events happening with the LA Valley in, in China. What? I had no did, idea. Did you not see that on Twitter? <laughs> no, I can't I remember who watched yeah, that. I'm trying to find it right now. Damn, I, yeah. I mean, I assume it was Halo because Halo tweets everything, but it, maybe it wasn't. There was something on the Reddit, though, I, I thought. Hey, maybe, I'm mis maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe it was yeah, somebody he, else. He secured uh, LGE, which is the, the organization, Lingani Esports, which is managing, has the managerial rights or whatever to this team that uh, Mortals have done whatever deal with. Uh, so they have secured a, a, a physical space in Nanjing, China, for training facilities and possible live events part of the agreement so yeah. who knows who knows what that's about but very yeah, important because that was no been, hill with the hookup and, and it's important because it has been reported that the la valley have been playing together in their team house or facility in nanjing already so you know that's quite important to the team yeah and ostensibly the reason that la valley even gave in the first place for them moving their entire organization to china was that there would be live event opportunities within the pandemic <laughs> I'm a Valley fan now. Yeah, that's damn it. Yeah. That's wow. That's Inverted. a cute cat. That's a very cute cat. That that's cat's a got a really cat. like, uh, like a a pinched mouth, but it's very sweet. Extremely kind sweet. Of my <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. right. Well, that's uh, another one of No Hills hookups. Photogenic what? animals. All right. What do you think about the the leadership overall here? Because it seems to me to be the right move for the Valiant. They actually got someone on the ground floor that knows the Chinese scene and has proven uh, history within Chinese Valorant as well. This this seems like a great pickup yeah. for the coaching staff. Yeah, No Hill is he's got it. it. Real quick, by the way, Josh. Thanks for getting me on this episode because I do think like you know. LA Valiant, you, you can, I don't think there's a person that knows the LA Valiant better considering Seth and I casted 7 out of 16 <laughs> of their damn games last season. <laughs> I went back and counted, right? Doa and ZP got 5, Vicky and George got 4, and Seth and I just had fucking 7 <laughs> Valiant games to We cast. appreciate your sacrifice, you know? Yeah. You did that to all of us. Thank you. Worst part is, I didn't even get to cast the one game of Valiant that I wanted to cast, which is when they took Numbani off of Philadelphia Fusion, and that actually locked out yeah. Philly Fusion from making it to that the was ZP, That was the one it? that I... That was the one that I wanted because I would have memed the hell out of Fusion for it. Do you know? Um, broadcast. Do you know? Do you know how many of those uh, matches I watched? Zero. No, I watched one of them. I watched <laughs> okay. the first one too. Yeah, no, I, I, I watched Actually, in full the that's first not true. one. Everything else got I watched two of them. Over. I watched I watched the first one. Realized they were a team that I should never pay attention to, and I was wasting my time. And then I tuned in to watch the vod of when they took the map off Philly and uh, and uh, ended up knocking them out of that tournament or whatever was going on. <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, I, I appreciate your sacrifice. Unfortunately, it was not witnessed by the world. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, had to, I had to be there, you know, strapped into a chair and just my eyes just peeled open watching this thing. <laughs> and um, No Hill, for whatever he watched, ca comes in and he just goes scorched earth. He's like, we're putting the, pushing the reset button. We're starting from the Stone Age again. Everything's got to go. Um, and to people that don't know No Hill's history, he was on that very very successful team cc roster again team cc is the shanghai dragons academy team um and they made a miraculous well, i don't even say miraculous it was just a, an incredibly good uh gauntlet run in 2020 that rivals what element mystic kind of did in their career uh because i look at that gauntlet run and they legitimately team cc under no hills coaching defeated every single korean team through yeah, that bracket yeah, in yeah. the playoffs, they just, they actually just beat all the Koreans. Like, that's like unheard of in international competition. It's the one for the top, watch, the, for the, the first contenders. place there, the the top first place. Yeah, that one. That yeah. one. Yeah, they they they. It's not even a tournament where you're like, oh, well, you know, maybe they got easy matchups. No, they had to actually go through every single Korean team, and I don't believe any team actually even took them to map five. They only lost one map per team uh, at at most, and you got like runaway and shit in there. Like these yeah, are yeah. these are. Big teams, right? Runaway was still really good back then. Um, Gen G, that was actually um, Stalker's best result with Gen G in, in that final as well. 
Um, so yeah, they, they just plowed through. Element Mystic was still good. Yeah, they lost Sparkle, but whatever, they're still a good team. So CC, led by No Hill, went on this huge run, one of the most historical runs in all of Tier 2, and one of the most respected coaches for that, for being able to do that. Um, and I've, you know, I kind of liken No Hill's career to Rushes in a way, where a super successful team nearly got the Grand Slam of Tier 2 as well, which to me would be winning every single event in Tier 2 possible, including the international ones. And to date, there's been no teams that have done that. Not even Element Mystic under Rush. They missed out on, I think, Korea Season 2, and CC missed out of China Season 2. So they all dropped, like, one season, but they won literally everything else and dominated the entire year. So No Hill's credentials off the back of that, like, if you looked at that and be like, well, Rush is a phenomenal coach from having had those credentials, I think No Hill's very much the same. His team trusts him. You saw that... I don't know if you could call it a report, but Dia had some words to say on, on Weibo, which is their sure. social media, about how much he believed in No Hill and how, you know, all these great words about their trust in No Hill and their belief in No Hill as a coach, and well, well, I he think, finally gets a shot. I think that's a great place to, to go from this, though, as well, because Dia was one of the people that turned down an Overwatch League offer last year from the same Smart organization man. because he thought, he, he just didn't have it in him to get shit blasted for an entire year. And the fact that Again. that's changed, I don't think that's necessarily like, you know, the guy's, the guy's been running a flower shop and he's run up the fucking bank account and he really needs an Overwatch League deal. I think it's actually that he just believes much more in this roster and thinks they'll have a chance in a completely different way to how he viewed the roster last year. Um, what is this? Is this this is this... A, an amazing thread of the uh, trying to go to sleep and some player was playing the game and No Hill like uh, woke up from his sleep or whatever and heard No Hill coaching a player at like two a.m. or something. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing it's an amazing insight because it tells you how much of a culture shift I suppose there is at the LA Valiant and uh, how much uh, faith the players put into No Hill and how much they respect him. Like he just finished coaching at three a.m. <laughs> like just went up from sleeping and just started coaching this player, right? Wait, um, is that is that saying that No Hill had a dream about how to coach someone, woke up, did it, and went back to sleep? Is that what that thread I can't is recall saying? Exactly. What did it, did it say? That read that again. What does it say? No, no he didn't have a dream. Awesome. <laughs> he slept at ten thirty, then woke up at two a.m. to give feedback to a player who hadn't slept yet. And if you scroll down, he says it says that No Hill had a dream about inspiration. Fucking amazing. No Hill oh, said wait. he dreamt of inspiration for coaching feedback. He went to sleep at ten thirty p.m. Had a dream about coaching. <laughs> woke up, implemented it, went back to sleep. Refused to elaborate. That is a fucking chad. That's an unbelievable chad coaching move. That's that's insane. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> that is an absurd I'm thread. I'm I have not seen that one. That one's amazing. Um, the, the player This quality, is what they though. need. They just need blessed, blessed coaching <laughs> feedback by dreams. You know, it couldn't be more... I mean, it couldn't be more superstition. Un uh, unbelievable. Um, consulted the forefathers, just <laughs> like the Panther style, you know? The player, <laughs> the player quality, though, I don't think it's unfair to these guys to say that it's lower than that Team CC team, right? I'm not trying to be down on this squad. I think they've got some good players. But that Team CC roster, maybe it's unfair to judge them in hindsight because I probably wouldn't have said that at the beginning of the year when they started their run. But with the benefit of hindsight, I think the player quality there is, is really high. I think, you know, you've got Gaga, Liga, you've got a, a very solid uh, backline there that didn't fully make it into the Overwatch League. You've got talent on that roster. This roster seems like it's a bit wonkier. There are some great pieces and some pieces that I'm questioning a bit more, and especially the tank line. Let's start with the support line i think because langser is a player that i know a lot of teams had their eye on as an upcoming talent i know the valiant were trialing him uh, like a couple of years ago even uh, at some point and then yeah. uh he as far as i'm aware was like a package deal this year with no hill that um the they kind of came together that you know if you picked up no hill he had the connection with langser isn't that dia i thought dia was the package yeah I was think, it, I mean, it oh possibly was both. I, I don't know. But I, it, was, it was my understanding that Langsa was uh, kind of attached to No Hill in, the, um, in that sense. Because Langsa was on Team Chaser. He was the, on the academy of Chengdu yeah. before this. 
What do you, what do you think about this backline? It seems talented to me. Uh, I, I guess I'll jump in. Like, obviously, yeah. Lynx is coming in from uh, Team Chaser, which had obviously an amazing run uh, as of recent. I, you know, we all saw him play for the Chengdu Hunters in 2020, I think it was. Yeah, we did, yeah. But I have no it memory. It was little, though. He was back yeah. behind developers yeah. still, so. I, I have, like, no memory of him playing at all that season, so I can't really speak to that. So I can't even really remember how good of a player Lynx is. But as I said, he was part of a dominant roster that went on a crazy one. Uh, one in the Chinese contenders most recently. Mm. So I'm excited about him. The person that I'm less excited about is Coldest. And I was really high on Coldest when he first got signed to the Hongzhou Spark. Yeah. And I don't know what to expect from him coming onto this Los Angeles Valiant roster because he only played in this most recent season, if I remember correctly, after the MCD incident. After MCD mm. was removed from the team, Coldest started stepping was up. That it? But it, yeah, I thought but he it, played that was more super late in the season as well. Super late in the season. Oh. And at that point, the Spark had already pretty much given up. Like they had already yeah. accepted that th this season was an L. Shy's great, but we suck. Um, and so <laughs> I'm excited to see, I guess, Coldest and Lynxa sort of be moved to the forefront. Do I have high expectations and high hopes, especially with how stacked some of these support lineups are? I'm a, I'm a little worried. And that's sort of why they are going down the list for me in the power ranking. I, um, I, I did look up the stats and I could be wrong. Either it was three hours each season or it was like three hours combined of the two seasons he spent on Axel Spark for Coldest. So that just tells you, like he barely saw any playtime. He was behind MCD and before that he was behind Bebe, I think in the 2020 season. So he just didn't see a ton of play. But we did see him uh, a few maps. Uh, one was, for example, on Oasis against Philadelphia Fusion, I think. Um, which he actually played quite well at, playing Ana specifically. And I think we primarily know him for his um, Ana play and his Desenyara play, which I actually think he could contribute to. So considering, you know, if you compare them with like Guangzhou Shards and stuff, I actually think this backline is quite competent and actually pretty good. It's just a shame we haven't seen a ton of coldest, but it's not like I'd go out of my way to say there's better tons of better players in contenders yeah. for example i think uh, yeah. he he's really deserving the chance to prove himself this year I, I have a philosophical question for you all which mm -hmm. pertains to this which is if if you how do you think about these kind of situations where you liked a player but then they didn't get very much play time so like you have these ideas about a player your perceptions don't really get altered by play time because you don't see too much of them and then it's you know a year two years down the road the, because my thought process is I tend to refer back to my thought process originally. I don't really get altered that much by the middle period, but I know for some, there are some instances where I believe in the management of those teams. And I think because I have faith in the management, I believe that the player was probably not that great because they didn't get the playtime. But when it comes to stuff like the Spark, I don't believe in that management. I don't have faith in them. So yeah. I don't think they yeah, probably true, yeah. made even the right decision. Like it's possible that Coldus, Coldus was a really good player, but they couldn't integrate him because he didn't, you know, there was communication barriers or they just fucking didn't run him for some reason. So how do you guys approach that kind of situation when you're thinking about somebody like this? Do you tend to still be positive, optimistic about it? Or do you think... He didn't get the playtime. He's probably not that good. Where, where do you end up leaning in that avenue? Well, I, I think that um, you're right about the Hangzhou management. I think they mismanaged the team. It was clear from the start when they even mismanaged Shai. And then, okay, you know, Pajon got the boot for that. But uh, even towards the end, just, just seeing Hangzhou go down a landslide, uh, they gave Coldest, and I, I think I actually went back and just checked this. It was three games, two regular season games, and then the, la the final play-ins game before the playoffs. That was it. He got three matches total that entire season and by that time like scott said they were already so far downhill that I, I don't think there was any saving of that team and he there's only so much he could do as well i still give coldest the benefit of the doubt there i think uh that he's got a lot to prove uh, he was the biggest name for flexible coming out of china this was before anyone knew about monk anyone knew about farway so coldest was like the og he just never got a chance and i'm hoping that in that time he hasn't gotten like washed up or he hasn't been out of practice clearly he's still got the motivation to play because he's on a team now that he wants to play on a team he wanted to play last year just didn't get the chance and i'm willing to again just give him the benefit of the doubt for that mm. I, I i completely agree with that rule because like as as you said like i played against coldest way back in the day in like 2019 in uh chinese what? contenders like when we were for australia world cup you played in chinese uh, contenders uh, <laughs> what was that year you were having a rough time huh for australia world cup in well 20 
uh, 18. I think we were we were screaming for that, and we played against right. a lot of Chinese contenders team because we had to go to Thailand. And Josh, you, I think yeah. you were actually there. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, that was a was fucking trying, event. I remember one going day drinking we'll in a tuk tuk actually one time. But yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll move on. Um, but yeah, like I remember screaming against Carlos. I'm like, this dude is sick. Like he was actually just putting in so much work. So when he got signed to the Spark, I was really excited to see more of him. But I think as time goes on and someone doesn't get playtime, regardless of how useless I think the management or coaching is, it still just wanes on me. It adds a bigger and bigger and bigger question mark. And the right. same thing for me is with Langsa. I haven't watched much of him recently as well. So it's like, how good is this uh, backline going to be? I think they can be solid, but I just have no idea. Like I can't even put them, rank them against other flex supports and main supports. I, I actually think this might may end up being a hot take, but I think they're going to be... And I understand that this is high praise. I think they're going to be about average in APAC. And I think that that's extremely high praise for a team that you don't expect to be very good. And there's only seven teams and there's stacked lineups. But no, I, I, th I, I, think, I think you're right. I mean, you, you look at a lot of the other support lines and they're filled with a lot of rookie players. Um, yeah. You know, whether it's Philadelphia Fusion with Fixa or I guess they're not all rookies, but even Soul Dynasty's background of like Vin Diamond Creative, which you can put some respect on too. But it's not out of this world for Lynx and Coldus to exceed some of those backlines. I don't, I don't think that's a super hot take. I could definitely see that. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, DPS then. Let, let's look at the DPS players that are on this team. You've got Dia, Innovation, Becky. So Dia is the most well-known. I mean, you were talking about the fact that he has a lot of faith in No Hill. We just saw the Twitter thread and stuff as well. Dia is talented. Even when he played in that first team where his uh, confidence must have been melted unbelievably, just steamrolled and crushed. I, I imagine that his, his mental in that season was like a compacting machine. It just got destroyed <laughs> just fundamentally every week. But uh, he's a talented player. He's a good player. What do you think about the DPS line overall, though? Can it actually hold a candle to the other DPS lines that are in APAC? Uh, before we go into this, because I, I don't want to actually go first, but Avril, I was looking at Dia's Wikipedia page. Did he not play last year at all? Because he, he obviously opted out of the Valiant, a very smart idea, but I was looking at his Wikipedia page and it says he didn't play in 2021 at all. No, he uh, spent the year streaming instead, to my knowledge. Uh, he was uh, his replacement. I think he, he might have played like super, super early in the season while his team was looking for a replacement, but then they got Easy Han and Easy Han came in and stepped in uh, to that position instead. And they had Easy Han Innovation Spectra, uh, of which Innovation is now made onto Valiant. He's been one along along with Dia, one of No Hill's disciples for the longest time because they were together on um, the old, the original CC back in the Gauntlet days of 2020, right? So um, Dia's still sharp, though. He's still super sharp to me. I've seen some of his recent footage, just looking at mechanics, obviously, because that's all you're going to get out of seeing him play ranked. There was that one super good uh vod that you you all can go and look this up by the way it's on youtube it's out there under the i think it's like um asia overwatch pro pov or pro footage or something and there's a <laughs> that's, that's the most vague title in the world <laughs> i'll find asia pro highlights i think it's yeah asia overwatch asia exactly called over overwatch asia highlights and there is a 10-ish minute vod of dia playing water maker and it's got some of the most monstrous the mechanics King, it is did yeah, yeah I watched that one. Yeah, I, I watched it's that one. It's disgusting, great. right? He hits, hits like some blinking tracers and stuff. It's like kind of nasty. It's it's wild. It's it's like, yeah. okay, we, you can comment about how good you think the other players are. That's regardless. That's not relevant to the conversation. He's actually doing with Coldus in this clip. He gets um, like he's, three picks there at the at the first point and just captures it for his... And then he actually, um, he actually <laughs> in Chinese, he, he says to Coldus, he, he finally misses a shot on a player because up until like 20 seconds in, he doesn't miss a single shot. And he's like, man, Coldus, you just made me miss a shot at a player because I was trying to help you. Uh, so my point is, and it's not just this clip, I, I've tuned into his streams as well sometimes. His mechanics are so fucking sharp. Like, they're still so good. Look at this. Look yeah, at this. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's nuts. Um, so yeah, I, I actually think, I mean, there's a tracer pick for you again. And he just kept this, keeps this going. I don't think he pops off quite as hard the rest of the map. Like, he doesn't just, like, win the team fights, But he finds some, like, nasty picks. Like, the mechanics are definitely there. I think Dia is, like, the go-to star DPS player on this squad if you compare him to, like, Innovation and Becky. I watched mostly VODs when Dia was actually on Team C, so I didn't watch a lot of the recent stuff with uh, Easy Han and Innovation playing together. But from what I gathered, if we want to move on to the other uh, DPS players sure. as well... Yeah. Um, 
innovation. I feel like he was more of a complimentary player. I feel like his tracer was probably his best pick. But like, how how would I trust innovation going up against the likes of like Profit and Fitz or even you know Choice One who has a good tracer on Guancho Charge? Yeah, yeah. This is where I could see this team struggle a little bit. Um, I don't know if you guys have watched more of uh, Innovation's recent play in 2021, uh, but both him and Becky, I wasn't really positively surprised by both of them. So I think it falls on Dia a lot for this DPS core to carry most of the momentum for the team. Innovation has a weird hero pool as well. I think that's one of his marks against him. I think his best uh, attribute is that he is a very veteran player with a lot of experience. In fact, he was actually... Because th here's a bit of a history of CC and No Hill as well. No Hill's got a unfortunately a bad rap in the China community in terms of professional Overwatch because of comments he made towards Chengdu, and you know he he was actually forced off that CC roster. Um, Shanghai removed him because there was some drama going on between him and Chengdu, and you know Shanghai and Chengdu were trying to make peace. Or I'm not going to get into that. That's you know, go and look that up yourself if you want. But the point is, when when No Hill leave, left the roster, CC kind of went downhill, and during that time. They tried to, you know, keep it going. So it was still maybe okay. Innovation actually stepped up to become a player coach, like a Jake type player where he's playing and coaching because they didn't have any other coaches. So he's kind of the another go-to in terms of someone that brings experience to the team that is going to be able to maybe assist coaching, even though Wukiel is going to be the official assistant coach. Um, Innovation's best hero is probably Tracer. He's also known for May and Sombra, and already just like you look at those three heroes, it's like what what is his hero for? It is <laughs> yeah. quite strange. Like yeah. his three best heroes are Tracer, May, uh, and um, what's the last one I said? He's Sombra. like Farah you... as well. I think I saw a, I I like him playing far on Nambani, or maybe that was not innovation. He's not norm. He's not normally meant to be a projector player. That would have been Spectra, if anybody, unless Spectra wasn't there. I was probably a different team um, then. Sorry. But Becky, um, Becky will be their projectile player. So I don't know, like. I, Maybe innovation won't even play because your deer for the hit scan who also has a tracer. If they want to go, if it's like a very very hard tracer meta, you have innovation who can just kind of one trick the tracer. But then you go back to what Johnny was saying: like, can he keep up with even say choice of Juan who was insane on tracer? That's a big question mark for me as well. Can can this DPS line as a whole keep up to any degree? I mean, even if we want to return back to deer for a moment, is deer going to be able to hold? up his own against the other hit scan players within APAC. There's some nasty names out there. There really is. I mean, you, you're competing against Lip. You're competing against Fitz. You're competing against uh, Shy. You're competing against uh, MN3. You know, like, this guy is not going to be favored in a lot of those matchups, in my opinion, even though he is sharp. Uh, do, do you have uh, do you have even higher opinions of Dia than you do of some of those names that I mentioned or do you expect him to still be like under average in APAC well that's one of my big problems when you have a player who takes a year off of competitive overwatch because he can dominate ranked as much as he wants but at the end of the day when you get into a structured environment and you are consistently playing against the best of the world that's when you really get tested and so the answer is i don't i, I don't really know like is da going to be able to especially if he is going to be expected to be the one to hard carry right if innovation or becky is going to be that sort of you know supporting role is da going to be able to put can you put all your resources into da and then he have like a shy level performance oh, right yeah. i don't know and until he proves that to me i'm not going to expect it. Mm. he's the best hope and yeah. he's got to play up against shy as well he's gonna have to he's gonna have to go exactly. up against shy yeah. so that's another question as well and shy is an absolute monster on that role yeah there's, there's um, a lot so of unbelievable hit scan monsters i mean when you think about great talents that have joined the league this year or like rejoined in dia's case th there's a lot of people who are really good but aren't going to be good enough because there are outrageous talents on the other side of the field, I think. So let's let's dig into the tank. We're already like over 30 minutes with this team preview for the Ooh. Beijing Bears. So um let's let's what talk tank? about yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the tanks. Let's talk about the recent stuff going on as well. Because there was some news that just dropped, Custer. So can you remind me of what occurred recently? All right. Before we go on to the tanks, let me talk about it because there was rumors that uh Mike Haley uh, who was right. most recently played for... Wait, who did Kaylee play for? It was for the... Guangzhou. The, it Guangzhou. was for Guangzhou, right? Just didn't perform very well as well. Kaylee apparently was on the Los Angeles Valiant. And as of this morning, I don't know if dates are relevant here, um, but apparently he's been since been dropped. So he never officially got announced, but now he's never officially not <laughs> been... He's Dude. not dropped. Okay, so he's come and gone. So don't worry Life about him. Life hits you fast, huh? 
That's <laughs> too real, honestly. And then the next rumor that we have coming from, if you look at the Liquipedia page, there is no tank. There was rumors that Hu Yao, who is now the assistant coach, was going to be a player coach. He was a player for Team CC uh, most recently. So people were excited about that. You know, Team CC reunion, obviously talented player. But there was a rumor that came out that Sashin, who was originally, who did Sashin play for? He was on the Spark. Hangzhou. As well. Hangzhou, yeah, the Hangzhou Spark. Hangzhou, yeah. He was on the Spark a couple of years ago. Didn't really do anything very interesting on the team. Very forgettable player. If you don't remember him, that's probably fair. <laughs> Apparently, he is going to be stepping into this role for the tank and that Huyo will just be an assistant coach, which is another weird one to me because I was like, okay, well, let's see what Sashin's been up to over the last you know, couple of years. Not he much. has not played since not the Hongjo Spark where he didn't play. So it's like, why is this the player that is getting promoted to the Los Angeles Valiant? What does No Hill see in him? And I don't know if anyone else has any context that I don't have, but well, it doesn't fill me with confidence. Well, just, no, just, just to talk about Sashin a little bit, I, this was a player that I was really excited about when he first got added to the Spark because I was watching him quite a lot in Contenders and I felt like he was a, a decent up-and-coming player. He had a really, really weird hero pool that went between... Uh, flex DPS and Diva, <laughs> and it was an, uh, he was an extremely odd player. But it was in that period of time where people were rotating between triple DPS and two two two. If you remember back way back when, so he was a really interesting player to watch because he had that ability to flex between like people like um, I guess Ding was doing that at the time, for example, where he was playing like Pharaoh and was also picking up the the Diva. If people remember that Shanghai Dragons squad that. Uh, that won stage three of uh, 2019. But when Sashin joined the Hangzhou Spark, he just was perma-benched, except he would occasionally come in to play like D.Va and Roadhog for the team in certain metas, and then he would just vanish again. And you didn't really get to see any of that flexibility, any of the cool stuff that I thought he could potentially showcase. I think they actually did have a decent win rate with him, even though he didn't get very much playtime, but I could be talking out my ass there because that was a long time ago, and I can't remember the stats. I just have a vague inkling that I, at some point, Johnny's pulled on it. those. Um, <laughs> but I think also when you're thinking about tank roles for Overwatch 2, and let's assume and give the benefit of the doubt here that No Hill, as a good coach, has done some level of scouting, done some level of trialing. He's not an idiot. I think with that prior knowledge of him being flexible and at least decently mechanically talented, not a fucking god, but he's decently mechanically gifted, he seems like an interesting pick, no? Coming towards Overwatch 2, someone that has, like, DPS experience in the past that you're putting into a tank role that can play, like, you know, a, a, a Doom or a reworked, more mechanically intensive uh, tank position. So I'm not crazy low on this move. I think McGravy posted a tweet where he said, you can't have it both ways. You can't gas up No Hill as a community and then also say, what the fuck are you doing picking up Sashin, you idiot? You can't have it both ways, That's right? True. Like, if you think he's a good coach, you have to give him some benefit of the doubt when he makes a weird move. And then only mm. the only valid criticism is if it fails afterwards. But you can certainly say that you don't understand what's going on or you, you, you doubt him or something, but... I think No Hill's earned enough faith to make a move like this and it not be utterly questionable, especially when you consider that they're probably not working with the largest bag in the world. And Josh, I think to speak to that though, like the other side of that coin would be that, well, yeah, you got to have faith in No Hill, but also what, what is he working with? Because like you said, he's probably not got the biggest yeah. bag and also Valiant is probably not the first destination for tanks to go to. So I don't think it's a sure. case where like you can just blindly trust No Hill. Like he looked at the entire tank pool, every sure. single player available. He's like, I want Sashin. That that yeah. can't be the truth either. It could be a limiting factor where like everybody all his first to five options went to other teams and he stuck with Sashin, right? And that could be a potential yeah. outcome of this. Absolutely. Um but a couple of things to clear up as well is that um just rewinding slightly, I won't spend too long on this. The Mike Haley thing, as far as we know, was real because he was literally reported to be playing in the team house, scrimming and living with the team in Nanjing, China. So, and, and now he's since been cut. Um, and then the Wu Hiao tank thing was also corroborated by a bunch of, I think both CC and also Valiant players who were speaking publicly about the fact that like, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what they said, but it was it was speaking in reference to him actually playing and not right. just being a coach. So that's how the kind of like Wu Hiao coach player thing happened. And I yeah. think the public response was a little bit lukewarm. They're like, oh, 
Wu Hiao, like, I don't know, I think we should get another tank. And so No Hill's like, all right, cut, fine, we're going to get rid of Wu Hiao, we're going to bring a sash, and everyone's like, no, 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 not like that, not like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you actually look at Sashin's Twitter, uh, Sashin underscore OW, he's got some pictures and some screenshots of high rank placements on the Asia ladder. So he's he had like three accounts in one, two, and three on tank as early as um as as recently as August fourteenth, and then his most recent season that he posted publicly, uh, December of last year, he had forty five hundred on all rolls. So I guess he's been still playing. He's still up to date. He's still good. He's still a top ranked player. And a bring me wow in um wow on the ladder. Yeah, he's going to be rotating between DPS, tank, support. He's the all round <laughs> flex player for the team. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a weird one, uh, but I I'm more positive about this than I think the overall community is. I I think it's a I don't think it's I actually have more faith in Sashin than I do in Wu Hyal, and that might seem ridiculous because Wu Hyal's had at least some level of recent performances in contenders. But to me, Wu Hyal is a known quantity, and you know you're going to get mediocrity. That's how I think about it. Uh Sashin, at least, I. I think has the potential to be better, even if it's a total flop. At least your range is a little higher, where you could get something a lot better out of him. That's how I'm thinking yeah. about this. And 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 something that Abril actually said on a technical crouch episode, like way back, I think, is that um, when you look at some of these teams, like a coach can really impact the way like um, various amounts depending on like what mechanical skill or individual skill you're actually dealing with. Like you can't take some of the worst teams and make them like super good based on coaching alone but coaching actually has quite a big of a degree if you want to get like a few individual placements here and there um so if we're looking at this team and we have a lot of faith in no hill bringing the most out of this team it's really important for him to bring in players that he's very comfortable with so even though there might be better players on the open market and players that the community is like hey why don't you pick up this player instead they're probably better than Sasuno or whatever this the, the, for this team to have a chance to win it really needs to be like an underdog story it needs to be about no hill inspiring these guys that they can actually win bringing forth some kind of camaraderie and whoever that player is that's going to be, bring just 10 percent more when it comes to like team dynamic or feedback coach ability stuff like that i think that's going to be the biggest boon for this team compared to the likes of Guangzhou charge. They might not have the same mechanical skill, yeah. but it's really important to get the perfect players to match the team environment. And so if No Hill wants to go with Sashin, fine. I, you know, I'm completely on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about keys to victory for the LA Valiant. And it's it's old testament god dreams for no hill just getting inspiration from from fucking <laughs> biblical times. He 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 goes to sleep, head on a rock, just Un his mind is unlocked. He's touched by God and realizes the path to victory. I think that's that's really what you're hoping for, is that he wakes up every day, 2 a.m., coaches the team between the hours of 2 and 2.40 a.m., and then goes back <laughs> to sleep. Well, I, I, something that I think is super valuable for the LA Valiant as well, and I think it's going to be a testament to No Hill, is first of all, I think they need to get off the block fast i think they need to start getting some wins and start looking really close because i think we've seen it happen to so many teams where they have like this rough around the edges roster like we see from the los angeles valiant as soon as you start losing more and more and more and more it gets almost impossible for you to pull yourself out of that hole so what's, i think that is gonna have to be on no hill to sort of like rally them especially if they start losing early what's the schedule what's the schedule in like? joe in week one Winnable. Oh. Winnable. That's winnable. 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 Yeah. Winnable. You guys, you guys are dismissing Spark again, but yeah, I'm, I'll, just go with it. I'll just go with it. They're obviously not favored in, I think, either of those games, but I think those are the two teams in APAC with the highest fecal bed matter percentages. I think that's that's what you're looking at, right? Is like shit the bed percentage is fairly high with both of the Joes. It's not massively high, but it's it's high enough that you can potentially capitalize. Yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe, I, they play. Maybe I have um, to tune in. <laughs> didn't the APAC region work? Like, you play each team one once per stage in the APAC region. Yeah, full round robin. Works. So, you know, they play. Hey, that's two winnable games per stage, yo. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good call. Uh, like two super mm, unwinnable games. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
<laughs> well, thank you, Tay Zonde, for watching this 45-minute episode about the LA Valiant. And um, if anyone else watched, leave a comment just saying that you were here at least because <laughs> uh, don't know who else would tune in. I think we've probably been speaking into a fucking void for this three quarters of an hour. But uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. We'll have another episode coming at you this week about NYXL. We've gone for a bit of a rebrand. We won't be talking about that though. But yeah. uh, the Overwatch League team is not. Anyway. And if you're at the end of this video and like the viewer number is a bit low, you know, th don't hesitate to use NordVPN to get multiple clients up. And maybe boost it up a little bit. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're not allowed. That's against TOS. That's against oh, TOS. Oh, okay. Never mind. Cut that out. <laughs> Cut out. But, um, but yeah, do, do share it with your friends. You know, if you've got any big fans of the LA Valiant, you know, if your mom's a big fan of the Valiant, share, share the episode with her if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.